It was 2002, and I was 26 years old. Connor was 27. We came to find out that we shared a birthday, September 14th, an early sign that it was meant to be. <laughs> We met at an off-Broadway theater in the Garment District of Manhattan. I was the bartender and an aspiring actress, and he was the drummer in the rock and roll musical show in there, and in an up-and-coming indie rock band called Sea Ray. He told me I was out of sight. <laughs> and that I made him feel all right. <laughs> I told him I had a knack for destruction. He said, good thing he dug construction. <laughs> I moved in with him after only knowing him for three weeks. I took with me only what I could fit in the trunk of a taxi, because who needed things <laughs> when you had love like ours? He would put me on all the guest lists at the hottest music venues on the Lower East Side, and we'd shamelessly make out in the green room before his shows. After, we'd hit the dive bars in the East Village, like the Holiday Cocktail Lounge, and kick back whiskeys and chain smoke Marlboro Reds till closing at 4 a.m. We'd sleep till early afternoon, and he would make me scrambled eggs and toast with perfect pats of butter. We'd eat breakfast in bed and watch music documentaries on his old bubble TV with rabbit ears on his VCR. He would let me <coughs> wear his cherished band t-shirts that he had saved from all the years he had been in bands, like his favorite one from his band, The Numbskulls. <laughs> and every night before we fell to sleep, he would hold me and he would sing softly in his deep, sexy voice, our song, Big Stars, 13, which asks, will you be an outlaw for my love? And I knew he would be. <laughs> we lived in this utter bliss, and it was our anniversary, and it was our shared birthday. We invited a group of friends over for a dinner party. He constructed a table. I found a gem of a tablecloth at the Goodwill. And somehow, our mismatched dishes and glasses and the sunflowers I set out and the candles I lit and the white lights he strung from tree to tree in our backyard in Brooklyn, made it look like something out of Martha Stewart. He surprised me, and he carried that bubble TV down five sets of steep stairs. We had upgraded to a DVD player. <laughs> and he set it up outside to screen a short film that I had acted in. It was a student film. It wasn't such a big deal. But he made me feel like a star. After our friends left, we sat side by side, laughing as we watched Chicklet, the house cat, do her tricks along the fence. He took me in his arms, and we danced. The spinners, I'll be around, played on the stereo. And he sang softly in my ear in his deep, sexy voice. Whenever you need me, I'll be there. Whenever you call me, I'll be there. 
and I believed him. <laughs> he pointed to the Brooklyn sky that we danced beneath. He pointed to the huge orange moon. He explained a harvest moon. And he said that he had hung that moon for me. And I believed him. <laughs> the show closed at the theater and Connor began touring all the time with his band. And I, I took it hard. He would be away and his calls were infrequent. And I had been experiencing this inexhaustible energy. I could walk the streets of Brooklyn into the Manhattan and back all day, all night. I rode the subways all night. I went home with strangers. I was spending a lot of time in churches, even though I was an atheist and Jewish before that. <laughs> And when Connor called, I would threaten to burn those beloved band t-shirts. But most significantly, I had started to believe that our life was a reality television show, being filmed 24 hours a day and broadcast live. I believed that Madonna was the executive producer, <laughs> and that the end game of the show was for Connor and I to form a band together and be given a record deal. The catch was, I wasn't supposed to know that this reality show was happening. I had to keep it a secret that I had figured it out, or the show would be canceled and no record deal. It became imperative that Connor and I did this band together. He did not want to be in a band with a girlfriend, especially one who never played an instrument and couldn't sing, <laughs> like really couldn't sing. <coughs> and I thought all the conflict that the band thing was causing was good for ratings and that Connor was playing along. and that Connor was playing along. Oops. <laughs> uh, it's all right. I'm sorry that I broke. Um, and I decided that the thing to do was to use the rent money that he had been giving me to pay for a professional demo, knowing that we would get our record deal. Well, we didn't, and we got evicted. Connor, he left, and me, a girl on the loose, with her broken dreams, and her faulty schemes moved out west to Los Angeles. I gaze up at that orange moon, our moon, this time from a cage, locked in on the smoking patio the size of a modest walk-in closet on a mental ward, surrounded by 25 other severely mentally ill people, myself included, having been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I gaze at that moon. I'm choking on the clouds of smoke the basketball court and grassy field that I can see through the cage taunts me. They never take us out. 
I rely on my memory to survive. I remember where he met me. I remember the mercury. I remember when he was sweet on me. And I know that tonight is the night that he is going to arrive and break me out of there. Because after all, he was an outlaw for my love. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And I hoped until that moon turned to sun and he didn't arrive. What I believed wasn't true. Now, I've been doing my own construction, piecing together my broken dreams, managing my faulty schemes, no longer a girl on the loose. I was cut from the noose of madness And now, when I look at that orange moon, our moon, the one he said he hung for me, I wish I could say that I don't wish that he will arrive and prove to be true an outlaw for my love, but I do, but I do.